Don't look now, but the Hawkeyes may just have the best linebacking group in not just the Big Ten, in all of college football. Caitlin Clark's a comedian, and uh, there's a certain former five-star offensive tackle that's in the transfer portal, but I'm sure you don't really want to hear any more about that. It is day one, and the floodgates are open. It is transfer portal season, and there we are here to run it all down on Hawkeyes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. We appreciate you all stopping by, as usual, Tuesday, 430 Central. Corey Bratta here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Hey, Corey. How you doing, Mark? I am doing just fine. As I had complimented you before we started to record on your uh, From the Hawkeye of the Storm gear, it's looking good. I like oh, well, that thank shirt. thank you. Rather dapper on Tuesday? <laughs> I'll yeah, take that as a compliment. You're me today. Uh, yeah, the, the, I don't, the only thing I don't like about it, and I said this to you before we jumped on the live, is it doesn't always contrast well with the dark background, so... I don't wear it a ton, but uh, yep, available at the merch store for anybody that wants to purchase. And possibly we made it even worse with our decor here. Uh, I, I, I have been lazy in recent weeks, and it's just easy for me to punch in the black to bam, it just goes black to the banner and then the back drop. But um, we'll work on that, folks. We'll make this look a little bit uh, more presentable, but hopefully you're here for the content and the discussion. And uh, we could go several different directions, but why don't we move all the football together? And we'll start with uh, what you let me know about uh, the other day with Caitlin Clark showing up on SNL. She is truly a star. And keep in mind, you are choosing to bring this up to me. I did not uh, propose this as a topic for the discussion. You are right. You are uh, wearing me down. That's what that is. (laughs) I saw you interacting with some people on social media earlier today. And uh, about Caitlin I, Clark, yes, yeah, about well, about this the WNBA salaries and all that oh, stuff. About I all saw, that, I saw those interactions, so <laughs> that's a I whole will, other topic. It is, and let me make very clear Caitlin Clark is going to be a multi millionaire next year. Well, probably this year, like the millions of dollars she's going to rake in. I mean, her salary in the WNBA is so minuscule compared to what she's going to make off of endorsements, off of jerseys, all that stuff. So did you see, Mark, she is, I I retweeted this, and I I honestly couldn't believe it. Uh, This is ridiculous. She has the highest, let me find the the exact tweet here. Two hours after being picked, Caitlin Clark became Fanatic's top-selling draft pick in any draft night history, surpassing Trevor Lawrence in 2021. That's crazy. I don't even know what that means. What do you mean what that means? I don't know what that means. Well, Fanatics is a is a huge you know what Fanatics is, right? So we're talking about fantasy sports. No, we're talking about her jersey. We're talking about her jersey. Okay. She yeah. Okay, she surpassed Trevor Lawrence who became who at the time sold the most jerseys after being selected in a draft. Unless I'm wrong, I that that okay. was what I No, I was just clarifying that. Okay. Yeah, that's what I understood the tweet to wow. be. But anyways, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see next month. Well, let's understand. I'm going to play it slightly off of the, uh, I don't know who the the co-host or the the anchor was in the SNL news skit. I don't, I don't know those guys. I've seen them, uh, but I haven't watched Saturday Night Live consistently in forever. Me either. Uh, but I'm going to play off of one of his jokes with the Jersey selling that if Caitlin Clark sold, do we know how many she sold or she, it was just the highest number? Yeah. Like if it yeah. was 10 million, she probably sold 10 million of the 10.001 million that were sold by anyone, including yeah. everybody in the WNBA draft. I will say that draft last night, I didn't watch it live. I was actually out. I knew she was going to get picked. It was great to see Kate Martin get selected in the second round. Um, but And it's not just the Caitlin Clark effect. We've talked about this. But the sport in general, there are more household names now that will be recognized at the WNBA level. Now, how much does this – What are you? why are you squinting your eyes? Household names besides her? Well, maybe not to you, but everybody in this country knows who – Angel Reese's. Everybody you, in this country. Well, everybody that knows who Caitlin Clark is pretty much knows who Angel Reese is. 
<laughs> okay. So, I mean, you can, I mean, there's always going to be people who are hermits and live under rocks, but in general, if people know who Caitlin Clark is, they know who Angel Reese is and they probably knew who Aaliyah Boston was last year. Okay. I've never heard that name in my well, life. That's your loss, Mark. That is your, <laughs> is this an loss. Iowa player or an no, LSU? No, player? No, it's not an Iowa player. South Carolina. Angel Reese is an LSU player. Who well, got yeah. I've night. heard of her. Because okay. of the scuffle, oh, right? That's well, when I first discovered her. Yeah, but who was the third player that you mentioned? I don't even remember who, who did I mention. Leah Boston. She yes. was the number one overall pick last year to the Fever from South Carolina. South Carolina. So, anyways, her and Caitlin will be teaming up together. So, Cam Brink is another one that uh, people. I mean, again, I'm not saying a lot of this isn't the Caitlin Clark effect because it is. Um. Springtime says Mark's just a WNBA hater. <laughs> yeah, I am a WNBA <laughs> hater. I am. I will admit to that. Like I, uh, I have nothing against it. Uh, the, yes, the you points, do. The points. Yes, you do. You <laughs> have a lot points, against it. The points that I made on social media was basically somebody made some kind of remark that Caitlin Clark's going to be making uh, the same amount of money as a school teacher. Okay. Well, first of all, Caitlin Clark bounces a basketball. So for somebody who is truly a good school teacher, they are more valuable to society than Caitlin Clark. All of that aside, it's all about supply and demand. It has nothing to do with who's really worth whatever. We have yeah. people doing nonsense on YouTube that make millions of dollars. That doesn't mean they're really worth that, but supply and demand uh, means that. And the WNBA has been supported by the end. Without the NBA, there would be no WNBA because it's been a failure. To this point. To this to point. Yes, this it's been a failure. Point. No one's And that's debating. why Caitlin Clark's only making seventy-five dollars to $90,000 a year, whatever those figures are. That's from, her, like that. from her WNBA salary. Yes, up until this point. And if she somehow just makes, if she becomes the Larry Bird slash Magic Johnson of her era, and the league just explodes, then she will benefit and all these other players will benefit from that. But I, I was making the point basically that they're overpaid because the league's in the red. They shouldn't be paying anybody anything. Well, I don't think uh, Caitlin Clark is going to be overpaid. I don't think you can pay her. Uh, when you looked at the crowd. I'm, that's not, I'm, that's not the, my point. Well, no, but the point was made. The point was brought up about Caitlin Clark. And her salary from the WNBA, what the Indiana Fever pay her based on supply and demand of the sport is one thing. What I'm saying, though, is that she is going to generate so many millions of dollars for the powers that be that are associated with that league that they've never seen before that she could not be paid. You could justify paying her exponentially more than the Fever have paid her. Well, that remains to be seen, and that's most likely true. Really? Not really. But it yeah, not really, because not all, for that all these, league. but there's all these big brands that have already forked over by millions of dollars to her for her already. That's kind of an indication that that's where the money's at right now. Like, and by the way, Nike's money, just as good as the WNBA's money. Buick's money, just as Absolutely. good as the WNBA's money. Powerade's money, just as good. State Farm's money, just as good. I'm not arguing any of that. Again, if those companies deem her worthy of that, and she is based on her popularity in college basketball and it at this point is transferring to the WNBA. I'm just talking about the league itself has been a failure. Therefore, that's why they pay their players $75,000 yes. a Nobody's, year. Who's debating that though? Uh, somebody on Twitter was debating that with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not debating that. And I was just I, pointing I will out say, the league has been a failure. It's been the, propped up by the NBA. The only, the only exception I take with the comment that a teacher is more impactful than someone dribbling a basketball is that's a little bit of a fair comparison to any individual that does anything non-education related. There may be things that you do. You may pick up garbage for a living. Are you less impactful than a teacher? I mean, you're part of the, you're part of the circle of life. Caitlin Clark has impacted. It continues to impact a lot of people. Now, what does that impact look like? How is that materialized? I can't put that into terms, into words. But when you look at the impact she's had in two hours after the draft, her becoming the top-selling jersey in rookie history of any sport, that's an indication that people care about her. She's become an icon not only in the sport, but in sports in general. 
So uh, impactful is such an arbitrary, generic word. We throw it around out there. But I mean, what, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that Caitlin Clark has been more impactful to me than probably at least five teachers. I could count five teachers on my left hand, Mark, that I don't remember Jack Squat from growing up that probably made just as much as Caitlin Clark's making for the WNBA. It doesn't mean they did a bad job. I'm just saying one teacher versus the impact she's making. I mean, that's a fair, that's an unfair comparison is what I'm saying. Are you talking about the impact to your business? No, I'm just talking about impact on life. We're not talking about, we're not talking about business. We're talking about impact on life. How has she impacted your life? How has she impacted my life? Yeah. Well, it's a big part of, yeah, it's a big part of my business happens to be for me. It's from a business standpoint, but for, you don't think for other kids that are spending eons of time watching Caitlin Clark film and trying to emulate that on the basketball court or buying jerseys or hanging posters or whatever. I mean, that's, I'm just saying that's an impact, whether you believe in that type of impact, whether you think that has a long-term effect for the, for the good and the, the positive of the community and society, that's up to you to decide, but that is still impact. Yeah, it's an impact. Absolutely. I, I was talking about a productive impact. Okay. Then Trevor Lawrence isn't a productive. Then none of those guys, none of the, I mean, what NFL players? Absolutely. I what completely NFL agree. Players I don't think people impact? should be looking up to. I think the, the point of the poster on Twitter is, is. Like their mentors. The point of the poster on Twitter is you see what these guys who are so, uh, that, that make the league and maybe are buried on the depth chart are making. And we're talking about the NFL and they're making exponentially more than the now considered to be the most iconic WNBA player. That seems unfair. Now, when we go back to supply and demand, I'm totally on board with what you're saying. And I think that's going to change and it will be accounted for with all it's already been accounted for with the dozens of endorsements and brand deals that Caitlin Clark has. But I can under, you can at least understand where a person comes from when they see the impact and you have good morning America and Saturday night live and the today show and all these big brands highlighting Caitlin Clark on a day-to-day basis. And she's making exponentially less than Joe Blow, who's the third string linebacker for the Jaguars. That seems unfair to the common fan when supply and demand are. Yes, it does. Whether you believe it or not, it does. Why? (laughs) Why? Because of what I just said. (laughs) Because of what I just said. (laughs) I mean, again, I'm not debating your concept of supply and demand. And again, that will change. That will that will transpire. But you 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 can't try to see the other side of the spectrum on this. Yeah, this has nothing to do, in my opinion, with Caitlin Clark or her being extraordinary at what she does and her possibly being a fine person. I have no idea. When I saw the SNL skit, I thought this is the first time I've ever heard her talk in my life. So I have I I have no opinion on her aside from she's obviously arguably the greatest college basketball player, women's college basketball ball player of all time. Um, and and she is reaping the benefits of that in terms of endorsements and so forth. So that's being supplemented. And I truly hope that if she plays long enough to have the type of impact on the WNBA that she may have, and it is giving indication that she reaps the benefits of that from the WNBA as well, and doesn't just become a trailblazer for all these other people to benefit from. Well, but she, yeah, I, I I agree. But ultimately, she's going to benefit whether it's directly from the WNBA or not. Right. She I mean, and by the way, your comment that you've never heard her speak, you must not watch any commercials because she's on like every other State Farm commercial on every major sports network. Yeah, I've never heard her speak in my life. So you don't watch commercials. You, you don't watch commercials during basketball try not to. games. Well, okay. first of all, I've not watched any basketball for a long, sure. long time. All right. For about 10 years. But during the football games, I didn't notice her. But I am the first to like final play. We're going to break. Boom. I'm on another football game. Okay. That's understandable then. And yeah, you wouldn't have probably heard her speak. And by the way, she's not the most eloquent speaker. Um, she you know, I a lot of these celebrities need help with vocal inflection and sense stress and modulation and all these things, but but she carries herself well. She she carries herself in a, a 
off the court. She seems to be very humble and with the moment. And that's what makes her connect to a lot of young people and old people. See, along those lines, actually, I thought she was very effective on SNL. And this is the reason why. Because she was so stiff and unrehearsed that, that let's say, so you can either really act or you can't. Like, if you took somebody like me, I would, like, try to act. And yep. it would probably be not be effective because I wouldn't be a really good actor, but I wouldn't be as stiff and direct as she is. I'd yeah. be somewhere in the middle. I'd try to act it out. It was funny because she just read off the cue cards and she was so, uh, I can't think of the term. It, it was just so direct and bland that it made it funny. I thought it was effective. And it was. It was really and they good. play that they, they, she was willing to play off of the the humor or, you know, the the fun that has been made of the league for a long time, women's basketball in general. And I thought that was great. And I thought it was a, a way to sort of um, blend and not. I mean, there's so much right now, even with the women's game, you probably don't know this because you're not following it, but there's so much animosity from certain people toward Caitlin Clark. I think a lot of it's jealousy, a lot of it's envy because she's taken the spotlight. She's become bigger than the game, whatever. Um, and I understand that. And it may be, it may be her impact on the league won't be reflected in league wide salary jumps. I think it will to some extent. Now, what type of a jump? I have no idea. I just don't know that an organization is going to be able to keep her afford to keep her you know, by not paying her, if she's bringing, if she's selling out every game and, and every, you know, all these ESPN broadcasts are, are, I mean, Mark, all, I think 35 of the 37 regular season games with a fever on national television, those games are going to be watched. Whether any of the other games in the league are watched, the games Caitlin Clark p plays in, especially this first season are going to be watched by a lot of people. The numbers would indicate that the, the numbers that we just witnessed from her time at Iowa, a lot of people who've never tuned in for a single WNBA game are going to be watching. So I just don't know if you're the fever, how you could afford to not pay her more down the line. I was actually surprised when I saw those numbers, but I don't know how the numbers are crunched out and it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. They must have some kind of formula like they do yeah. in the NFL. Uh, one point that I'd like to make, and then I'm, I'm good to go. But in regards to your fairness statement, this is the way the world works. If SNL was fair, they would be honoring South Carolina is the national champion and have them on, but they're not going to draw anything close to what Caitlin Clark's going to draw. So they go for the money and make a business decision. But it was not a, it was not a Iowa featured show. It was a Caitlin Clark featured show. So yeah, it wasn't like they honored Iowa. They honored Caitlin Clark, who's the best player and just won the wooden award. Well, the only reason I think of that is because on Twitter, there were people saying, why wasn't South Carolina there? Because they won the championship. I've never seen anybody who didn't win a championship that's been that celebrated. Yeah. Well, it's because it people would watch. <laughs> yeah. Nobody would have watched that. No. Nobody would have watched. they don't know who they are. Correct. In large part. Yeah. Um, a couple of news and notes, Mark, before we address a couple of news and notes that you have. Can I run through a couple of things here? Absolutely. Just I'll make the point that the South Carolina basketball team should thank Caitlin Clark because they're probably more well, they are well more well known and their championship highlighted because of her. Agree. I agree with that completely. The sport should thank Caitlin Clark as a whole. People like Diana Taurasi and these people who have went out of their way to rip Caitlin Clark in, in spite of the fact that she has single-handedly helped to grow the game as much as she has, should be ashamed of themselves. That's my opinion. Uh, Caden Proctor, officially in the portal. Pete Thamel um, reporting that today. It's been anticipated here for, what, two to three weeks. So he is officially on his way back to Alabama. He's got a do not contact tag, which means he's made his decision. Uh, somebody in the, the chat earlier said, uh, is he going to get busted for tampering again? for violations again, or is Bama going to get busted for tampering? Mark, what, like, does the NCAA care? Are they doing anything about this kind of thing? It's almost like there's no shame in it. Like he was, he was fine with making the media known that two to three weeks before the portal window opened, he was headed back to Bama. So, I mean, basically he's admitting that, yeah, I've already had, like, you can't just say I'm going to go somewhere without being sure that this place will take you back. 
unless there's contact being made. Now, contact's made through players, through parents. That's the whole point. It's such a stupid rule that's not enforceable when you can tamper through a person, through a person, through a person. But he is headed back to Alabama as expected. I don't really care. I think it's – I'm just glad that we can get the formalities out of the way. So that's one uh, note. Also, TJ Bowlers, um, defensive end from the Iowa City area who was a four-star a couple of years ago. I believe he was a Clear Creek Amana standout. He's from Tiffin, small town, basically part of Iowa City now. It's all grown together. He is in the portal. It was a Wisconsin Really highly touted kid at a high school. A lot of the powers wanted him. He's back in the portal. Um, I, I doubt he comes to Iowa, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if what the – I've not talked to TJ. I don't know TJ or his family. I've not talked to anybody with intel on that. But I did tweet it out yesterday because it's he's an Iowa City kid. And so that's of note. And, uh, of course, as you mentioned at the outset, Jacob Bostic, Iowa receiver Jacob Bostic, is in the portal as well. So – Lots of stuff happening right now. Um, Carson May's back in the portal as well. Former Iowa quarterback who transferred to Wyoming. So uh, he continues to look for a home. So uh, there you have it. Do you think the uh, subtraction of Bostic has any impact on what the rotation would have looked like this year? I think he was on some two deeps. Was he on the spring two deeps? I don't really pay a whole lot of attention to those preseason, the pre-spring depth charts um, because it's before really anything occurs based upon really nothing, right? Maybe some winter conditioning um, evaluation, but in large part, Kirk has downplayed those depth charts and, and ultimately who cares? You have all of spring, you have summer conditioning, then you have fall camp before you actually get a, a real idea of who's going to be starting that, that wide receiver room has been so abysmal for so long. Mark, I ran through, I posted a video earlier today on my channel about this disturbing trend of numbers. And if people want to go over there and watch it, I encourage them to go to my channel from the Hawkeye of the Storm and just watch it's a very short video. And I'll talk more about this down the line. But I, I want to read these numbers to you, Mark. And you tell me, and, and I know this is sort of anecdotal because we can't measure it. We don't have other numbers to measure it against right now. But since the end of, let's just go beginning of 2022 calendar year, okay? Beginning of the 2022 calendar year. And when I say that, I'm talking, let's, let's rephrase that, post-2021 season. So in other words, 2022 cycle, some guys could have entered late in the 21 season. That would have been part of the 22 transfer portal cycle. Listen to the number of receivers on scholarship from Iowa who have left the program. Jacob Bostic, Deontay Vines, Arlen Bruce IV, Keegan Johnson, Charlie Jones, Tyrone Tracy, Desmond Hudson, Quavon Matthews, Brody Brecht gave up football for baseball. That is eight, if you count Brecht, nine players in the 22, 23, 24 portal cycles. And we just started this portal cycle. So is it possible you get another one in there? I'm, I guess anything's possible. Eight to nine different guys. You want to know since 2020, since that the end of the 2021 season. How many guys have finished their careers at Iowa? How many scholarship receivers who have finished out their careers at Iowa? You're asking me to yeah. fill in the blank? How many, how, many, how many players do you think have finished their careers at Iowa? Whether because they, they – this is going to be almost humorous that I say this – either because they declared for the NFL draft early or because they graduated – how many well, wide zero <laughs> declared for the NFL draft? Early. How many scholarship receivers over the last three years, since the end of the 2021 season, have finished their careers at Iowa? Three. The answer is two. Nico Ragaini and Max Cooper. Max That's it. Cooper. Yeah, Max what Cooper. I know that was going to be do? your first. He didn't do anything. Okay. He was on scholarship. He, I mean, my one big memory of Max Cooper, he seemed like a nice guy. I think somebody told me the other day he's got a, a podcast on YouTube. So I guess he's a competitor. So I'm not trying to rip a competitor here, Mark. <laughs> but Max Cooper uh, didn't really play much at Iowa. It was a kind of a speedster coming in. I think he was the same class as Smith Marset and Brandon Smith, red shirted, dealt with some injuries. Uh, I remember he muffed a punt at Wisconsin when um, I think it was either Cooper or Gene or Charlie Jones went down. And, um, but that's basically all I remember Max Cooper doing. Really didn't do anything at wide receiver position. Two guys? Doesn't that seem... That's got to be... like. <laughs> I, 
can't, I don't know what those numbers, how those numbers compare to every other Big Ten school, but I'd love for somebody to tell me. I'm going to sign one of our stats guys. It's either Kyle bottom. or Tony. It, it has to be. That's crazy. Eight to nine scholarship receivers. 22 cycle through 24 cycle have left Iowa and not finished their careers as part of the Iowa football program. Whereas only two scholarship receivers have graduated, finished their careers at Iowa. That's incredible. I can summarize the Iowa football product in this manner. No other team in the conference needs to spread out its wealth of talent, development, and production. So that's three things. You start with talent, you develop the talent, then you get production out of that. More than Iowa. We are going to talk linebackers today. We're talking about arguably the best unit in the country, and they don't have any wide receivers. Well, I mean, that yeah, I mean that's a little unfair to say hey, they have no wide receivers. They have Caleb Brown, who's an Ohio State transfer. <laughs> what are you laughing at? He's a four-star kid. I'm not saying he'll... he's done nothing. And uh, yeah, he's done nothing. We'll. No, yes. I'm not saying he's no good and he, he doesn't have any talent. I, I am would be the last person to say that, but man, that's that's the ceiling right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> When's the last time any receiver has done much of anything at Iowa? When's the last time? I mean, Smith Marset's numbers were extremely modest at Iowa. Brandon Smith's numbers were extremely modest at Iowa. Nick Easley was productive. But, like, there's a former walk-on from Newton. Like, in general, this receiver room has been so bad. And those those eight transfers, nine if you count Brody Breck leaving the program when he did, is a microcosm of that. And I'm lo- like, the reason I bring that up is I'm looking at the, the uh, gamut of guys they have this year, and I'm like, wow, uh, they have... What, six guys on scholarship? Let's see. Caleb Brown, Seth Anderson, Alex Moda, Dayton Howard, uh, Jared Bowie. Five guys now, if I'm counting correctly, on scholarship at receiver. And based on like numbers and and um, history, recent history, you expect probably three to four of those guys to not finish their careers at Iowa. I just find that fascinating. And that's one of the reasons why John Budmeyer being promoted as the wide receivers coach when he's had no experience at the position. They've had issues recruiting at that position. He's a former quarterbacks guy who didn't particularly uh, impress too many people uh, outside the confines of the Iowa facility working with the quarterbacks for the last few years. That just seemed like an odd odd hire, and I'll double down on that take. I hope it works out. I mentioned that in the, the video earlier. I hope he turns this program, turns the – the uh, room around and um, yeah, Bostic leaving was a little unexpected. He was part of media availability last week and I listened to his available. I was not there for that availability, but I listened to some of the the video footage, the audio from him um, after I heard he was in the portal today and he was very complimentary of Tim Lester and Caleb Brown and the guys in that room. So maybe he made a decision here in the last couple of days I sure wouldn't think, Mark, that Iowa would have put him out there before the media when they only select a few players to speak to the media. I wouldn't think they would have done that had they known he was leaving. So my guess is either A, he didn't tell them he was leaving, or B, he hadn't decided to leave until now. Um, But he is leaving, and perhaps part of that is because Jarrett Bowie has come on strong. Uh, Tampa native have heard some good things about him so far this spring. Um, So... You know, hopefully you can, I mean, you're going to have to, Seth Anderson's dinged up right now. He's not practicing, but uh, I mean, hopefully with between Caleb Brown, Seth Anderson, um, Jared Bowie, I don't know where to go. Like, I, I really don't know who to go to at, after that. Um, boy, <laughs> they need to go to the portal at receiver again. Isn't that sad? Again. So the open practice is at, I believe, 11:45 Eastern, so 10:45 Central on Saturday. Uh, I'll confirm that. I believe you're correct. Let the, me, those uh... are the numbers that I saw. So Corey will be there, and uh, I'm going to ask you this right on the air and put the pressure on you. But uh, in the midst of everything that you're doing, if if at any point uh, 
that evening or at whatever point uh, you can stop by the Voice of College Football, we would love to have you for a quick hit. Wonderful. Or whether that's that uh, that particular day or not. Um, and then also one other thing, Jackson, if you're in the chat, if you are in the chat, uh, if you can grab Corey's video that he uh, mentioned, his his latest video that was just posted today, put that in the chat so people have the link there. And then also, if you would be so kind, grab my rant about the transfer portal because I went on a bit of a rant as well. And you could drop that as well because it really much speaks to what's going on right now uh, that I think we've this has just gotten to a point with the Caden Proctor situation, there were two others like it at Louisville where players are not even playing out a season. They are, they are taking basically gear, food, housing, uh, workout facilities, and they're taking another player's reps in spring practice, not Caden Proctor, but in the uh, examples that I gave, and then they're taking off for somewhere else. So they're not just a big zero. They are a negative to those programs. They are killing resources. Now, we'll say this. If you're going to look take a positive spin um, as it relates to your approach on Iowa and, and the practices running into the portal window, because that seems contradictory to even have that because then you can't focus your attention on the portal. Some schools finish their spring either this last Saturday or well before last Saturday. If there is any advantage to that, Mark, it's that there's a potential. And I know that Iowa and Kirk would say that like Saturday's practice is just one of what, 20 or whatever it is. And so it's you, you've got to take it with a grain of salt. However, I would think that it's maybe weighed slightly differently because it's in front of a bunch of people. Don't you think, Mark, especially for younger guys, that maybe you'd look at that a little differently when you're in Kinnick in front of a crowd on the final practice of the spring period, perhaps you you weigh that a little differently. My point in bringing that up is because their spring period runs into the portal window, guys like Jacob Bostic won't steal snaps from anybody on that Saturday. And if we get any more entries here over the next couple of days, those guys won't be with the team on Saturday practicing. So at least that will give the opportunity in front of a crowd for maybe some younger guys who will likely stay with the program to see significant time, whether that be Alex Moda, Dayton Howard's another name that's been trendy. Um, again, somebody needs to emerge. Obviously, Jarrett Bowie. I mean, Bowie's going to have an opportunity as a starter. I mean, unless they just load up at tight end and start. I can't imagine this new Tim Lester system that they're going to be running a bunch of two to three tight end sets every time. So they're going to have to play receivers. Maybe it's Terrell Washington, who sounds like he's maybe converting over to receiver. He's one guy I didn't mention. But um, they're running him more at receiver. Maybe that's part of the reason Bostick's leaving because Bowie and and uh, Terrell Washington Jr. have jumped him. But the, the bottom line is the trend of players who have left, many of which have been at the top of Iowa's depth chart. Like Deontay Vines is a starter. Arlen Bruce was a starter. Keegan Johnson was a starter. Charlie Jones is a starter. De Tracy was a starter. Like all those guys were starters. So there's a trend there, whether you like it or not. Folks, we appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football, Hawkeyes Live with Corey, each and every Tuesday at 4.30 Central Time. Make it on back next week. We've got about 10 minutes left, so why don't we move on to the complete opposite end of the spectrum when it comes to position, talent, production, development, everything going on there. And I am astounded still by this number. If you follow stats, if you're a stats guy like me, you know if a linebacker cleans up 100 tackles, even if everything's funneled to him, that's a lot of tackles. You typically have one guy per team that eclipses 100 tackles. Jay Higgins, 171 tackles last year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's on the field a lot, right? That's part of it. Um, yeah, they did, they did have what we went through this a couple months ago, the third or fourth most snaps as a defense in the country last year surprised it wasn't number one but anyways uh they're getting off the field a lot too a lot of i wonder if there's any you think there's any team in the country with as many uh flips possession yeah changes. possession changes that would be a stat to find mark i bet that iowa leads the country in possession I changes. Bet. uh so yeah obviously it starts with nick jackson jay higgins i mean what a luxury to get those two guys back both of those guys could have jumped to the league 
Um, you're going to hear people like Cooper DeGene uh, get their names called, his name called on uh, here in a couple of weeks at the draft. Um, so, yeah, just to get Jay Higgins back and Nick Jackson, obviously really productive guys, veteran leaders, both graduates. And then, uh, you know, after that, you've got a lot of young talent. Kyler Fisher's an older, experienced guy who also returned. Um, but I, I don't know what he is, what where he figures into this whole thing. Now he is a scholarship guy, so if you're concerned about the the uh, scholarships being in the red, that's one thing I brought up when he when his return was made official. That um, you know, it's just one more guy you've got to account for, and I just don't know is his is his primary impact going to be on special teams? You know, maybe he's been a special team star since he's been at Iowa, but then when they play more four two five, you're going to get that extra DB on the on the field. Um, likely Sebastian Castro, who's also returning. So, um, you know, Kyler Fisher's a guy. Uh, Aiden Hall's a guy I really like. Um, I don't know where his development is, but I love the work ethic. He's a, as a grinder out of Harlan, Iowa, a school with a lot of history, storied history of the high school ranks. Uh, ben Keeter, four-star, another Iowa City kid who is a, a wrestling star as well. Um I'm guessing you're going to get somebody in this group that jumps to the portal because I just think there's too many guys. Um, Landon Van Kekerix is a linebacker right now. I believe he switched over. I, I think he came in as an athlete. Maybe he just started a linebacker, but um, he's listed as a, as a linebacker right now. He's on scholarship. Um, Jaden Montgomery is another one I would watch for. have not heard anything on him. Those would probably be two guys I'd look for here in the coming days to make decisions on whether they hang tight at Iowa or leave. And if, if at some point I was just going to have to tell guys, hey, you're not going to play <laughs> and we need the scholarship um, as as cruel as that sounds. Um, Jaden Harrell. Sounds like he's progressed well. Kirk has brought his name into the mix, but he's also a junior. So if he feels like he's not going to get in the field much, I could see him jumping into the portal. Would not be shocked by that. Zach tweets another kid. Now he's a he's an Iowa kid. He's from north of, of me here in Story County from Story City. Um, he's been in the news for some um, Good Samaritan acts over the last couple of years, but not much as it relates to football. He's a junior. Carson Shire has dealt with a bunch of injuries. He's a junior. They are loaded, loaded, loaded at that position, Mark. And uh, that's not even taking into account people like mm -hmm. Devin Van Ness, the younger brother of Lucas Van Ness, Eric Epinesa, younger brother of AJ Epinesa. Now, those guys are not on scholarship, but um, you know they come from good blood. And um, there's some other um, walk-ons, Jackson Rexroth, the guy who's seen some time on the depth charts, the two deeps over the last couple of seasons. So they are deep, deep, deep at linebacker. I wanted to wait to preview this group until now because, well, first of all, we have two positions left heading into today. We had linebacker to cover and we had O-line to cover. I know almost nothing about this O-line other than who they return. So I want to get a good look at them on Saturday. This linebacking room is, is uh, I mean, there's, it's hard to imagine me looking like a fool come Saturday afternoon because it's like the safest bet, I think, anywhere on the football field for Iowa right now. And that includes punter. That includes kicker. That includes defensive line, DBs. They are strongest on the football field at linebacker, and that's a good thing. Yeah, they have produced and two at least two all Big Ten linebackers four consecutive seasons. And uh, as, as Corey has outlined, they bring back all their scholarship players at the position. So there may just not be enough room. I looked at an article in where, in which Seth Wallace was commenting over and over, Hey, we love all these guys who want them to stay, but we will be talking about whether, uh, although we don't believe the transfer portal is typically a good route to go, but for somebody it may be because we just, we have so many players and uh, we don't have room for all of them. Is Seth Wallace really as good as what this? And, and I know that they they brought in Nick Jackson as a transfer player, and obviously the talent is what it is. But uh, in regards to the production of these linebackers, year after year after year, well, there's a reason that he's making over a million dollars as a position coach. And remember, they elevated him to what associate head coach here a couple of months ago. Um, I don't know if that was to the chagrin of people like LeVar Woods, who later interviewed for the Tampa Bay Bucks special teams coordinator position. Um, both those guys have been phenomenal assistant coaches for Kirk, but it's clear Kirk values Seth a lot, and he's had opportunities to go other places. We've talked about that. Um, 
but ultimately, like, I mean, it's credit to everybody because, and, I, and he would say the same thing. Phil Parker deserves a lot of the credit. Uh, these guys are recruited from various parts of the country. I mean, a lot of them are local kids. Obviously, mentioned guys like Aiden Hall, Zach Tweet, I think Jack Campbell, Seth Benson. Those are all Iowa Midwest kids. I guess Seth Benson with South Dakota. But my point is, like, in general, recruiting is a joint effort, especially with how they kind of divvy up regions. So, no, he's been phenomenal. Um, and that's kind of it, – it is the polar opposite of what you've seen at quarterback, at receiver, um, to an extent here recently at O-line. You know, lack of recruitment, lack of development, and maybe even lack of evaluation. And by the way, for those people that are like, how could Iowa be so bad on all three fun- all three fronts? Sometimes those fronts go hand in hand. Like if you can't evaluate a high school kid to recruit and offer a kid a scholarship, what makes you think they're going to be able to evaluate kids lining up on the field heading into a game? Like, I'm just saying in general, that's been... That's been a uh, point of uh, angst from the fan base, and I think deserve rightfully so. We're not there in practice every day, but those positions have struggled on game day. So if it's the the uh, the chicken, the egg, or the whatever comes before that, Mark, <laughs> uh, it, it is what it is. It's they're not performing, but linebackers just been stellar, as you said. Hawkeye fan, I'll address this very quickly. I don't know how a program underperforms its talent when it averages going 11 and one. And that's not an exaggeration. That is the average record, like the last 17 or 18 years, 11 and one. How are you underperforming? Okay. I mean, I I think the first part of his statement is absolutely fair, right? In general. Absolutely. On one side of the ball. Let me ask you this, Mark. Was it was it last year? I'm getting my years confused. When did I tell man? This is crazy. Was it two years ago that I said to you preseason that Iowa perhaps had the best linebacking core in the country? I think it was. It was when they had Justin Jacobs, Jack Campbell, Seth Benson, and you kind of questioned that. Yeah. And then it was up against that really stellar Alabama linebacking core. And then following the season, I think we both looked at it and were like, "Well, they're neck and neck." Mm -hmm. They're different types of defenses, but they were neck and neck. And last year, based upon the numbers, now again, a heavier burden was placed on the Iowa defense on that linebacking core. You didn't really have any stellar defensive linemen. I mean, I know Logan Lee tested really well at the combine, but he was his production was modest at Iowa. So, I mean, there was a bit of a load put on Nick Jackson and Jay Higgins. But, I mean, how would Iowa's linebacking core last year compare with linebacking cores across the country. They had to be top four or five, right? Absolutely. And I think that's, I, I based on what they're returning, I mean, you said they don't lose any scholarship players. They're, they are primed to be right there again. And that is something special, especially when you think about a program like Iowa that is not ever really been thought of as, you know, line, nobody ever says linebacker you as it relates to Iowa. And I'm not saying they should, but for them to be, over the last few seasons, this consistently, not just good, but great, dominant. That's uh it's impressive. And then you go back further. I mean, think about the Josie Jewell, Bo Bauer years back into the 2017, 2016, 2015 years. They've been good for a while. For sure. Appreciate you all being here at the Voice of College Football. We do this uh, with Corey each and every Tuesday. It's at 5:30 Eastern, 4:30 where it counts. And you can catch Corey's work there at From the Hawkeye of the Storm, of course. And again, check out Corey's latest video just posted a few hours ago. And uh, our Nebraska show, which usually lines up right after this one, will be moved to later this week. So we will keep you updated on that. Uh, We appreciate you all stopping by uh, our transfer portal update. We're going to do those every day at 3 p.m. Eastern time on the national channel a transfer portal live update, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Had plenty to talk about today, and I'm sure we will as well on Wednesday. All right, Corey, great show. Appreciate you being here. Have a great uh, rest of your week, and we'll make it back here next Tuesday. Sounds good, Mark.